Welcome to Out of This World. I'm Matthew DiNicolantonio. He is Scott Sutherland, meteorologist and science writer. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about space weather, which, yeah. if I'm being totally honest, of all the episodes of Out of This World we've recorded so far, uh, maybe the most difficult for me to wrap my head around for some of this stuff. So yeah. put your thinking caps on, take your notebooks out. There will be a quiz <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. No quiz at no the quizzes. end of the episode. No quizzes. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of really interesting stuff. As I mentioned, yeah. we're talking about space weather. This is not, you know, thunderstorms in outer space no. or anything like that. Though no. we can draw, uh, you know, some some comparisons. So let's start with a really broad definition. What exactly is space weather? Right. Space weather is a term that they use to describe any kind of solar activity uh, that has any impact on Earth, on us, our technologies. Yeah on Earth or around Earth or on even on other planets in the solar right. system. Okay, so yeah. we'll, we got a lot of different terms that we're going to, to run through. That's why I said right. take out your notebook so we can uh, <laughs> follow along. But yeah. uh, we'll begin with uh, solar wind. So right. Sort of like when we think about the sun, there's a constant outflow That's right. from the sun. And, yeah. and that, essentially that is what what we're referring to as solar wind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's That's the first sort of analogous thing about, about weather. When we talk about solar activity, uh, this is, yeah, it's a constant flow of, of charged particles, mostly electrons, some, um, uh, maybe some other like uh, helium and hydrogen nuclei floating around there as well. But this is sort of like, think of it kind of like a pot of boiling water okay. and how steam escapes from that pot, pot of boiling water from the surface. This is particles that are escaping from the, the solar corona mm -hmm. into space. And normally that's a fairly sedate flow. It's just like very gradual. But this is tons of matter every second leaving the sun, floating out into, into the solar system. All right. Next, yeah. uh, we'll talk about sunspots. Now, right. uh, cool, dark regions of the sun. When you think about the sun, yeah. you, you, you know, we look at it in the sky. It's always very bright. You it wouldn't is. think that there are dark spots of yeah. this, you know, giant ball of energy uh, that is the center of our solar system. But that's, that's right. essentially what they are. Yeah, exactly. Um, the sun is like, is a, a giant ball of plasma powered by fusion energy at its core. And that causes kind of like the same analogy of the bo boiling pot of water. There's this convective uh, soup of, of all these charged particles moving around. And this creates a lot of magnetic fields. And the small, there's small magnetic fields that poke out of the surface. These create little loops and these can create tangles because it's so chaotic, the motion of the, of the, these convective cells mm -hmm. that the, ta the, the magnetic fields get tangled up in one another. It's almost like sort of uh, wrapping a bunch of um, elastic bands around each other. Yeah. And when that reaches the surface, normally all the, all the solar uh, surface, we call it, at the, the top layer of the sun's uh, convective cells, it all the stuff rises to the surface, cools a little bit, and then sinks back down. In those areas, those tangled magnetic fields don't allow that material to sink back down. Okay. So it just stays there and continuously radiates its heat off into space. So to our view looking at it, it looks a lot darker than the surrounding bright right. surface. It's still well over a thousand degrees Celsius, yes, of several, <laughs> several thousand degrees Celsius, but just comparatively, mm -hmm. it looks darker and you can actually see along the edges. It kind of looks like, um, uh, I don't know, like a little pattern being carved around it. And that's where the, those magnetic fields are tangled around it, holding that in place and not mm -hmm. letting it sink back down and reheat. All right. We've got a lot of analogies today yeah, yeah. Uh, on Out of This World, uh, ways to help us all uh, understand this. So uh, in a similar way, let's talk about a, a coronal hole. Right. Sort of like a, it, we're going to stick with that tangled sort of mindset here. Yeah. But in this case, it's like, it's with the sun's overarching magnetic field, the one that reaches billions of kilometers out into the solar system. Mm -hmm. Those, those magnetic field lines get sort of tangled up a little bit or stretched out and it creates like a gap in the magnetic field. And this allows an even faster stream of the solar wind to exit that area. And these areas, these coronal holes can be relatively small. Um, I mean, they're still many, many times larger than the earth, but some of them can ex like expand uh, the length of an entire hemisphere of the sun. They can uh, be even larger in some cases, uh, but those are just, they create these um, like fast streams of the solar wind. Mm -hmm. We call them, well, a coronal hole, high speed streams. Um, uh, 
very appropriately named. Yep. <laughs> um, sometimes simple and, is better. <laughs> yeah, sometimes simple is better. Uh, and it's when you look, at, if you were able to see the solar wind from above, it would kind of look like a pinwheel. As the sun rotates, mm -hmm. these streams would go out. It would be these these denser, slower moving sections, and then these faster streams uh, that are kind of like a like a raging river, almost like the I guess it's kind of like the solar jet stream. Okay. Think of it like that. Yeah, no, it's great. It, compared to the wind that, yeah. that you would normally see. So it's much, much faster and um, creates some interesting effects if it when it when it passes by Earth. Okay. So uh, let's stick with our rubber band analogy yeah. uh, as we go into solar flares. Yeah. Okay. So with that tangle of, of magnetic fields or that tangle of, of uh, elastic bands, if you say like you tug on that elastic band tangle a little bit and they suddenly unravel, mm -hmm. That's kind of the same thing that happens with a solar flare. These tangled magnetic fields around the edge of the, the sunspot can sometimes just suddenly and violently reorganize themselves or reconnect between themselves. And it releases a lot of energy in the process. And we see that as bright, bright flashes of ultraviolet and X-rays. Um, and these can saturate the upper atmosphere of Earth uh, create radio blackouts and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and they can sort of, as a follow-up beyond that, they can produce other effects, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm that can have even more interesting impacts on Earth. All right, so uh, I mentioned uh, off the top, we're not necessarily gonna draw a, co a comparison to a thunderstorm in outer space, right, right. but there are still uh, things that we will refer to as storms. Yeah. Solar storms. Solar storms, yeah. So that more interesting thing when, when you have a solar flare is they, the technical term for it is a coronal mass ejection or a CME. Solar storm sounds cooler. Solar storm definitely <laughs> sounds cooler, yeah. But it's sort of, it's the same analogy. Like if you think of like a, a sun solar flare as being like a very, very concentrated, uh, very high energy thing like a tornado. Okay. This is more like the hurricane of solar activity. Right. So you have these coronal loops. They can have billions of tons of solar matter all along their length. And when a solar flare goes off, it can break these, these loops completely off of the sun's surface. And they stream out into space as an eruption. Um, and as they go, they expand outward. And they're not always aimed at Earth. I mean, there's a lot of space all around of the course. sun. We're a fairly small part of that. But if any of these uh, CMEs were to sweep past Earth, either as a, a direct hit or a, just a glancing blow, the, uh, the magnetic charge carried by that cloud of particles can interact with Earth's geomagnetic field mm -hmm. and produce some uh, some pretty spectacular results. All right. Yeah. Uh, it sounds a little bit scary. Not it's some, lie. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> um, right, but let's stick on the on storms. Uh, and I think this is what you're uh, referring to, geomagnetic yeah, storms. That's right. So a geomagnetic storm is the, the resulting effect of a CME sweeping past Earth. Uh, this can also happen due to the, that transition point between the fast and the slow streams of the solar wind. Um, but it's usually in response to a lot of solar particles arriving at Earth uh, all at once, and sometimes very quickly, mm -hmm. and with very, very high energy. And it causes a disturbance. It's almost like, um, kind of like uh, ringing a bell with a hammer. Right. So you, you, uh, if you do it very, very gently and just tap it, there's a little bit of an effect. If you hit really hard, very loud noise, kind of the same thing where if you have a very weak CME, sweep past Earth, just causes a little movement in the magnetic field of Earth, maybe a little bit of an effect, probably you might, well, you might see some auroras, mm -hmm. mostly up in the, up north, but the, the more energetic, the more dense and the faster moving that CME happens to be, the, f the greater the impact, the more particles that get streamed into Earth's atmosphere, the farther south that those auroras will push. But there's a negative ap aspect, and this is the somewhat scary part, in that really, really powerful geomagnetic storms can have impacts on our, our power grids, mm -hmm. on our uh, data transfer, like the, the, the cables that run underneath the ocean to deliver data for the internet, uh, and satellites in orbit, mm -hmm. and as well as that space, um, anybody in space, astronauts, right. uh, have to take refuge on the space station mm -hmm. when something like this passes by. 
All right, we'll talk a little bit more about those effects uh, and, and those sort of larger scale events, but you right. mentioned the auroras. Yes. Um, so let's sort of uh, wrap up this section of, uh, of how uh, it impacts what we see or feel, the auroras are obviously a, a visible impact of, these, of yes. these, uh, these solar events. Yeah, a lot of a lot of it goes on um, without us seeing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you have the special uh, telescope that can look at the sun, you might see sunspots then. NASA has satellites in orbit of the, the uh, European Space Agency as well. Uh, weather satellites have sensors that watch the sun constantly to see these impacts. But the biggest thing that we see here on Earth is the auroras. Mm -hmm. And most of the time they're limited to up north, right? Um, but during bigger events, they push farther south. If we have clear skies, uh, sometimes they, they come right over Southern Ontario down into the United States. Uh, and uh, they can be, they can be uh, barely noticeable, uh, especially if there's a lot of um, uh, urban light pollution in the area, yep. but sometimes they can be extremely vibrant, uh, ripples and curtains and sheets of these colors uh, sweeping over the sky in spectacular displays. They could run the system for days afterwards after disconnecting the batteries from the system. There was that much residual charge left on the lines. If that were to happen today with all of our interconnected power grids, the effects would be magnitudes worse. So let's talk about obviously the sun very far away, but we always feel the the effects obviously right. of it. Um, so how can Space weather sort of travel all the way from the sun to us on Earth. Right. So the the uh, solar wind itself is just based on the fact that the the little particles are moving so fast that they can escape the sun's gravity. So it's very gradual. The uh, CMEs, coronal mass ejections, tend to be accelerated by the energy that they absorb from the solar flare. So the stronger the solar flare, the more energy it it packs into that right. that CME eruption, and the faster it will go. Um, sometimes it takes like, uh, but maybe two to three days for a CME to reach us uh, at the low, at the, the low end, the fastest ones are like 18 hours. Okay. Um, and the 18 hour ones are the ones we really, we don't want those. Right. Those are the ones that could cause really big problems with us. Mm -hmm. We want those just sedate, lazy mm -hmm. CMEs. Let's, yeah. let's talk about those problematic ones. Can right. we on earth be hurt by space weather? Um, Mostly no, right. but there there are there are some effects that can uh, sort of heighten the the impacts to us. Um, mostly, the the atmosphere is a really good protector okay. against um, any X rays or, or ultraviolet rays that come off the sun, even from those from the solar flare. Um, now, a sol a strong solar flare will will ionize the upper atmosphere. All the X rays hitting the top of the atmosphere will will uh, excite the uh, ionosphere, they call it, the charged area of our upper atmosphere, and cause radio blackouts. And that right. can be problematic for things like um, uh, hurricane relief work mm -hmm. or, or disaster relief mm -hmm. uh, and, and so forth. Um, flights passing over the North and South Poles can have difficulties, um, not, not with the technology necessarily, but that can increase the amount of radiation right. that you receive uh, because the the the, uh, the Earth's magnetic field isn't quite as strong at the poles, and so if you're somebody who frequently flies between Europe and North America, or if you're a pilot or or um, a steward, then you you would probably want to not do that for a very long time right. because that increases your chances of developing health issues. Right. Um, but in most cases, as anybody who's above the atmosphere on the space station or or spacecraft. Um, anybody who goes to the moon, um, will be at, Lu at Lunar Gateway. We'll have to worry about these things. And anybody traveling to Mars in the future will also have that sort of thing to worry about on a pretty much regular basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what protects us from space weather? Um, well, the atmosphere is a really good blockage. It's right. like a shield almost. The Earth's magnetic field as, as well, um, sort of diverts a lot of these things around us, these these uh, the solar wind and these CMEs tend to be pushed around uh, the um, the the magnetic field, uh, except in certain cases when the conditions are just right, where Earth's magnetic field and that uh, that the magnetic field from that cloud of solar plasma is opposite. They tend to connect rather than mm -hmm. push against each other. It's kind of like putting two magnets together. Right. Or if you you have them oppositely uh, oriented and you try to 
push them together, they, they yeah. click together really easily. If they're the same and you try to push them together, it's a, it's really tough. Right. So it works the same way up out in space. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, we just sort of have to rely on these sort of natural things to, to, uh, sort of interpose in between us and, mm -hmm. and those effects. Mm -hmm. Uh, because other than that, it's, uh, um, sort of, we just have to, you know, rely on that, but it's the technology. It's our technology. That's the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way of putting it to, uh, to the effects of space weather. Um, a, a really, really strong, uh, geomagnetic storm, uh, can cause, can generate electricity along long distance power lines. We saw this in 1989 mm -hmm. in March, uh, with the Quebec blackout, mm -hmm. um, DC current and AC current don't like each other mm -hmm. if they don't want to be on the same line and alternating current being sent down from Northern Quebec to Southern Quebec from the hydroelectric plants was being interfered with by direct current generated by the fluctuating magnetic fields and they canceled each other out. They burned out the, the capacitors that, that are all arrayed along the lines to keep the, the current flowing and blacked out the entire system for hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if something really, really big were to happen, such as we've seen, um, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it would be, uh, disastrous for our technology these days. All right. Let's talk about some of those, you know, the worst solar storms in history. Right. Uh, we'll start with Carrington events. Yeah. And so we're going yeah. back into the, you know, the 1800s here. Yeah. Um, yeah. but sort of the, the worst that we've seen. Uh, let's, let's start there. Right. So, uh, September 1859, um, a, a, an astronomer was watching the sun with his solar telescope and saw a visible light solar flare. Like he actually was watching a solar or a sunspot and saw a bright flash. That was probably the highest energy flare ever witnessed. Mm -hmm. Um, because these flares are all in the ultraviolet far beyond where we can see with our human eye, but the greater the energy, the farther it spreads out on either end. And if it dips into the visible range, that that's a huge amount of energy being released. Mm -hmm. 18 hours later, the skies erupt in auroras so bright that in like the Northern United States and in Canada, they could read a newspaper by the light wow. at middle of the night. Wow. And they, there have been reports at the time that people saw the auroras on the horizon all the way in Northern South America. So they dipped all the way down almost to the equator. Mm -hmm. um, on the, that's the spectacular part. Right. On the negative side, the telegraph systems that were operating at the time uh, shocked their operators because of that same effect of mm -hmm. the, the power lines or well, the telegraph lines absorbing that or having that electricity generated along their length. And they shocked the operators. They set tel telegraph poles on fire and they could run the system for days afterwards after disconnecting the batteries from the system. There was that much residual oh, wow. charge mm -hmm. left on the lines. If that were to happen today with all of our interconnected power grids, the effects would be magnitudes worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now there have been a number of other events, yeah. sort of similar, but obviously not nearly as strong. Yeah. Uh, early 1900s, 1940s, yep. and even, you know, in, in the 2000s, uh, yep, and yep. as recently as, as a couple of years ago. Um, so are these events becoming more frequent? It doesn't seem like it. Okay. Uh, it seems like they're fairly random, which, okay. um, I mean, they put limits on like when we can see uh, a Carrington-like event. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment they figure once every century or so. And so, okay. Kind of, we might be overdue. <laughs> yeah, that's what but, I was going to say. But We're yeah, for one. yeah. But back in 2012, we actually did see one. It just didn't affect us. Right. Uh, scientists were looking at the data that they got from the satellites and they, they saw a couple of smaller CMEs sort of go off and they, they cleared out the section of, of the, the solar wind. And so that this really big uh, coronal mass ejection went off right after that that swept through all that clear space in, in record time, mm -hmm. I think it was. So, uh, but the, the, the good part about that is that it was aimed ahead of us in our orbit. The, the sunspot that blew off that solar flare and that CME had already passed, you know, it was almost dipping off 
the face of the sun from our perspective. So it was, we were safe from it. Mm -hmm. Nine days earlier, if it had gone off, direct hit, and we probably would have been blacked out for months, if not longer. Mm -hmm. All that yeah. makes me think of is you said 2012. You know, there was all of that talk of end of days yeah. in 2012. Yeah. Maybe it was, not lost off by not, nine days. Not <laughs> lost on us at the time. Yeah. Trust me. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, let's talk about solar cycles uh, right now. It's sort okay. of hard to imagine that, you know, the sun, um, I guess, becoming stronger and, and weaker in, right. in a cyclical manner. But that's essentially what happens. Yeah. It, and it's it's... Now, the sun's heat doesn't really change all that much. It's the activity that we see. So um, it being the, the giant plasma ball that it is, it generates a lot of magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields kind of oscillate. So it's almost like it wrote, it's almost like the magnetic field rotates. Gotcha. And it goes from like north to south once every 11 years and then south to north again. Mm -hmm. And so like uh, back in 2017, I believe it was, or in 20, between then and 2019, uh, the magnetic field was oriented opposite to Earth's. But now we're almost halfway through the next solar cycle after this. And so it's, uh, we're about even. Right now, I think that the, the solar north, uh, the, the magnetic solar north pole is probably around the solar equator and, okay. the, and the poles are south. It's a little weird to, to think about considering the fact that Earth's magnetic field doesn't all change all that much, right. really. But this happens every, every once every 11 years. It's kind of mm -hmm. weird that way. But uh, the sun is constant from our point of view, but very, very active and a very variable mm -hmm. star, for that matter, mm -hmm. for changing on this on this. 11 year cycle every every did our position or, or where we are in the solar cycle have an impact on the solar eclipse that was seen over north america it did yeah um back in 2017 when we had the last one that passed over america um we were out near the the end of that particular solar cycle solar cycle 24 uh so the sun was relatively quiet as far as the activity goes the corona uh, was a little bit dimmer, wasn't quite as many streamers coming off of it. But this time around, we're so close to the, this maximum of solar cycle 25 that we saw a much, much more active uh, corona. We mm -hmm. saw some of those prominences, like that. there was a really, really bright one uh, towards the bottom of the, the sun. Um, and we didn't see that back then because right. the, the, the activity level was different at the time. Uh, okay, so... Yeah. Space weather, space weather events, I guess. Um, you mentioned scientists monitoring this. How yep. far in advance uh, are they able to uh, detect this or, or forecast this? Right. So uh, based on how things move, it's about three days that, that they have a good idea of when we might see a geomagnetic storm. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's satellites in orbit uh, that are the, the Solar Dynamics Observatory from NASA. There's the ESA, NASA... Uh, solar and heliospheric observatory, so SOHO they call it, um, and and the weather satellites like uh, the GOES satellites that give us our, our weather for right. weather data, also have sensors that look backward towards the sun, um, and these all have a constant monitoring of the activity there. There's also ones that they're called coronagraphs, where it takes a little disc and it sticks that over top of the direct light from the sun so that you can see everything going on around it. It's like putting your hand up so that you block out the light from a light bulb and you can mm -hmm. see what's going on around. Mm -hmm. Same same situation. So these are constantly watching the sun. So they see when these events happen, these solar flares, the coronal mass ejections. And we've had enough data from those over the years that they can time it really well so that they can watch that, that CME leave Soho's point of view of that coronagraph and go, okay, it, it took this amount of time to do it. So we know that it's moving this quickly. So we can plug that into our little computer models, spit out a, a new forecast that'll show it'll arrive in two and a half days or a day and a half or 16 hours or something like that. And um, based on that, they can issue an idea of uh, what are we thinking as far as the geomagnetic storm? If it's fairly sedate moving, it's probably gonna be a fairly weak one. But if it's really fast, it was really bright, there was a really strong solar flare that set it off, then they might be forecasting more like uh, an extreme or severe geomagnetic storm that would arrive at that time. And we've had these over the years where they've said, we're going to see a G4 uh, mm -hmm. 
severe geomagnetic right. storm in the next couple of days. And pow, we saw bright auroras. Um, fortunately, most of our satellites are protected against these things. They're, they're built specifically with space weather in mind uh, so that they don't suffer the ill effects of it. But um, we've already had some situations where uh, Starlink, there were Starlink satellites launched by SpaceX and they lost 40 of them oh, wow. uh, the day after I think they launched because uh, we saw a really strong geomagnetic storm uh, and a solar flare that kind of puffed up the upper atmosphere, put a lot of drag on those newly launched satellites and just pulled them back down into the atmosphere. And that's one of the biggest worries um, that the, the, these impacts will just strip low Earth orbit of these satellites that, that are pretty important for our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. All right, pencils down. Uh, I think we've uh, we've covered a lot on yeah. this world today, yeah. and now you know a little bit more for uh, next time you're out trying to impress some friends. A lot of uh, space <laughs> weather trivia that you can uh, you can offer. Scott, thank you so much for being with us uh, yeah. today. This has been another episode of Out of This World. <laughs> It's very pretty out here.